Welcome to the Michael Shermer Show. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. As you can see, we have a new studio. Well, not exactly. This is the same studio, but just angle the computer differently there. I'm going to try to mix it up a little bit. Before I introduce today's guest, uh, I want to tell you about our sponsor, The Great Courses. Great Courses Plus is an app you just touch on your phone or it opens up right uh, to whatever course you were last listening to, or you can scroll through hundreds of different courses. This one I've been listening to this week uh, and on my bike ride with my buddy Mike. Uh, we were talking about these lectures on liberty on trial in America. And uh, these are the cases that define freedom. Douglas O. Linder, J.D. Uh, and here he, he kind of goes through all these different uh, trials that shaped current law about freedom and liberty, religious freedom, uh, property, liberties, and uh, the abolition of slavery, and, and so forth. Anyway, so... Here's the deal. When you sign up for The Great Courses Plus access uh, to all these different courses, uh, you can get a free trial and then a discount, the equivalent of um, basically 30 bucks uh, a year for this access through uh, my show. So you go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Shermer. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Shermer to get uh, your free trial and discount on this program. Now, my guest today is Benjamin Friedman. His book is Religion and the Rise of Capitalism. Benjamin Friedman is the William Joseph Meyer Professor of Political Economy and former chairman of the Department of Economics at Harvard University, where he's taught for the nearly half a century. Friedman's two previous general interest books are Day of Reckoning, The Consequences of American Economic Policy Under Reagan and After, and The Moral Consequences of Economic Growth. He has also written extensively on issues of economic policy for both economics, economists and economic policymakers, and he's a frequent contributor to national publications, especially the New York Review of Books. He lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I spoke to him today via Skype as usual on all manner of topics related to religion and economics, going all the way back to before Adam Smith and David Hume through the 18th century Scottish Enlightenment into the 19th century rise of um, the social gospel versus versus the prosperity gospel into the 20th century with what happened during the Great Depression and why there was so much prosperity after that, after the Second World War, and yet so much poverty, and how that led to that constant tension in different uh, religious sects over w to what extent uh, we have a moral obligation to help those who are um, not as prosperous as others uh, into the Reagan era, the rise of the moral majority, uh, what happened uh, in that and that movement pushing back against godless communism when the communist uh, threat uh, ended in the 1990s, and uh, all the way up into the 21st century uh, issues we're dealing with today. And, uh, and then we go off the book, and I, we talk about um, putting 2020 into perspective, that is, economically, to what extent can we just keep printing money and distributing it, I talk about, we talk about the end of poverty and uh, the rise of a kind of a post-scarcity or Treconomics system in the next century or two and uh, the rise of AI and uh, what that's going to do to work and what it even means to work, what that's going to mean in coming uh, decades and centuries. Um, I ask him about UBI and uh, economic inequality. So we had all the really interesting topics. He is very sharp, very clear thinker and one of the great minds really in political economics and history of our time. So I was honored to speak with him. With that, I give you Benjamin Friedman. So let's just get right into it. Um, I want to start with uh, where you start the book with uh, John Maynard Keynes' famous uh, line, a uh, quote from his general theory of employment, interest, and money, because I think this lays the foundation for why the subject is one of the most important I'll ever cover on this podcast and any that any of us can study. Here's John Maynard Keynes. The ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influences are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. Mad men in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler a few years back. <laughs> So start. Let's start there. Um, you start with uh, the concept of a worldview, and Einstein and and uh, and economists have worldviews. So let, let's let's start right, right there. The reason I thought the Keynes quotation was apt, Michael, 
is that I don't want to pretend that the people who gave us modern Western economics, like Adam Smith and David Hume, were self-consciously trying to bring their religious beliefs to bear on their economics. For uh, listeners who haven't seen the book, the central argument is that religious thinking was a very important contributor to the origins of Western economics, including the thinking of people like Smith and Hume. Uh, But these people were celebrities in their own lifetime. We know lots about them biographically. And one thing we know for sure is that these were not religiously committed individuals. Uh, Hume was an outspoken opponent of any kind of organized religion. He was a Uh, an avowed skeptic, an agnostic. Most people, including me, think he was an atheist. Uh, Smith was more private about his personal uh, religious beliefs, but there's no reason to think that he had any deep religious commitment. As an American, I would think of him comparably to uh, people like Benjamin Franklin and uh, Thomas Jefferson. We think of them as deists today. And so, If it isn't the case and wasn't that these were religiously committed individuals who self-consciously wanted to bring their religious beliefs to bear on their professional work, there has to be some other story. And I think the story is the one that you uh, quote from Keynes and also you mentioned the Einstein uh, idea, which I'm happy to go into about the notion of a worldview Uh, These people were influenced back in the 18th century by the religious thinking of their time, even though they weren't religious individuals. And that's important, because if I had to uh, claim that the origin of religious beliefs on modern, bearing on modern Western economics, depended on religiously committed individuals, I sure couldn't have started this story with Smith and Hume, and if I couldn't start the story with Smith and Hume, then I'm in big trouble because we all recognize that that's where modern Western economics came from. So that's the relevance of the Keynes quotation. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's good. And even though I'm an atheist now, uh, uh, when I debate theologians and theists, they make the case that uh, the entire concept of Western science, grounded as it is in the idea that the universe is knowable, and it's governed by laws, uh, is actually a Christian idea. At least this is what they claim, going back to you know the late Middle Ages, early modern period, and into Newton and so forth, that, 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 that those are actually theological I- ideas, that the universe is governable and we can know it. I think, that, I think that's right. Uh, this was called natural theology many years ago, natural theology to contrast it with revealed theology instead of saying we know things about the divine because of what God told Moses on Mount Sinai or some other form of revelation, the Natural Theology Project uh, was to say that uh, the divine created the universe, and we learn about the divine from looking at the universe that was created. Incidentally, that's exactly what Newton intended for his great work, the Principia Mathematica, Uh, Newton uh, said that he wanted his book to be used as a way of allowing people to gain an insight into the divine by looking at the world that God had created. And you mentioned notions of uh, not just knowability, but causation, system, mechanism. All of these were ideas that had been kicking around for a while, but were Uh, became especially uh, acute and relevant in the English-speaking world with the publication of Newton's Principia in the late 17th century. And it's important to remember that people like Adam Smith and David Hume were of a generation who had all been trained in, in, uh, in Newtonian thinking. So they were an aspect of their time which emphasized exactly these ideas of systematic causation and mechanism and all that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm reminded of uh, in the second edition of The Origin of Species, Darwin penned a 
kind of an apologia for why religious people seem to be uh, offended by his theory of evolution by natural selection. And he reminded readers that in Newton's time, um, that some theologians were concerned that perhaps this was uh, removing God from the equation or something like that. But that, in fact, Leibniz and others pointed out, well, this is how God creates solar systems and universes. He uses gravity. And so Darwin was implying, you know, maybe natural selection is the way that God creates diversity of life forms. You don't have to give up your religion to accept the science. Well, yes, although Dar in the case of Darwin is actually somewhat interesting and different because there's an element of randomness in the mutations that drive the story in Darwin. So uh, I think the tension between Darwinism and, uh, say, Christian belief is acute in the way that it wouldn't have been for these earlier thinkers. In the, in, in the earlier day, before Darwin, it would not have occurred to people <clears throat> to think that religion and science were on the opposite sides of a debate. But that did uh, come about as a result of Darwin. And I've always had the view that it, it's, it's a result of the randomness, that uh, if, if, you thought, if you thought that the genetic mutations that Darwin uh, places at the center of his theory— now, again, I'm speaking loosely because, remember, Darwin preceded Mendel, and so we didn't have the theory of, of, of genes and heredity the way we do now. But putting it all together, if you thought that uh, the divine had steered these uh, genetic mutations, then it would be, I think, for most people, uh, most believers, not very threatening. But the whole Darwinian idea is that these mutations are uh, random, and therefore that takes away the notion of divine purpose. So I, I think it's understandable why for uh, serious believers, Darwin is a threat in the way that the other scientists weren't. Yeah. Well, and it was made worse by that uh, late 19th century movement to create a warfare model of science and religion that... So the, they retold that Galileo story like, you know, he's the lone voice standing up against the church and he's prosecuted for just simply telling the truth about the way things really are. And yet it moves, he allegedly said, you know, when showing the instruments of torture. You know, the story is way more complex than that. And, 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 and of course, as I like to tell the story about how he got Saturn wrong and no one ever points out where Galileo was wrong or all the other theories that were floating about at the time, like a Tycho Brahe's modified Copernican model in which all the planets go around the sun, and then that whole system goes around the central Earth. Uh, you know, no one talks about that because that one turned out to be wrong. So we have sort of a survivor bias of the theories that turned out to be right, and then we you know, kind of reconstruct it in a cardboard history way to make it look like science triumphed over religion. And I think it's pretty well understood among historians now that that's just too over, overly simplified. Well, I think also... Uh, <clears throat> Look, science progresses, uh, economics progresses too, and it would be quite not just wrong but unfair to go back and say, look, do we think any statement by Adam Smith 250 years ago was wrong? Well, of course there are probably some if you go through, and in the same way, uh, not everything that these people like Galileo said turned out to be right. For that matter, there's a lot of uh, question about some of the specifics of Darwin. My late colleague, Steve Gould, who taught um, evolutionary science here at Harvard, um, offered several, he would have said, corrections to Darwin's idea. Didn't undermine the notion of Darwinism. He Steve would have thought of these as uh, refinements, I think, uh, but... He, he, the modern science doesn't go back and say, look, as of, what was it, uh, 1859, uh, everything that's knowable about uh, genetics and uh, evolution was right there in Darwin's book, and everything he said had to be correct. Of course, that isn't true. Yeah. 
Yeah, now Gould's uh, punctuated equilibrium is often portrayed as like some uh, revolutionary overturning of Darwinism, which he never said it was. Uh, and, and, you know, just a minor wrinkle, really, according to Dawkins, <laughs> on natural selection. It's really just a description of the fossil record of how species uh, are formed in these peripheral isolates uh, under pressure due to whatever environmental factors are. And so you don't see many changes there because it happens so rapidly in the fossil record. Anyway. Uh, you, you mentioned, um, uh, you know, we were talking about Darwin for a second, that Darwin, Darwinism, the theory of evolution by natural selection, was accepted largely in the scientific community without a mechanism. So this is interesting that a, a theory can be uh, well-grounded or proven or tested or whatever without knowing the underlying mechanisms that's driving it. Uh, I'm not sure this uh, was the case for plate tectonics and continental drift. You know, Wegener proposed this, what, in 1929? It wasn't until the 1960s that... This was largely accepted because it re required a mechanism. What could possibly push continents around the globe? And uh, and then the further mapping of the magnetic uh, floor of the, uh, of the Atlantic, you could see it spreading, and that would cause the continents to drift. So let's go back to economics and human smith and so forth. And it wasn't They didn't really have a mechanism for why free markets and capitalism work so well, but they were able to establish that it does work just observationally, right? Well, I think I would disagree with that. I would say that the precursors of Smith uh, understood, some of them anyway, the key proposition that individuals acting on their own uh, self-interest can end up making other people better off. In the English-speaking world, the famous person who said that was Bernard Mandeville. This was 70 years before Smith's Wealth of Nations. And there was a, a Frenchman named Pierre Nicole who had said the same thing back in the 1680s. So at one level, the proposition about the potentially beneficial effect, beneficial for other people, effect of uh, individuals acting on their self-interest was uh, somewhat known. But I think that the crux of Smith's contribution was precisely to provide a causal story with a mechanism. And what Smith showed was that the mechanism was competition carried out in markets. And uh, Smith did that in strikingly Newtonian language. There's all this discussion of how the price mechanism works and uh, each side of the bargain in setting a price or setting wages uh, the sellers are just trying to get as much money as they can. The, uh, the buyers are trying to pay as little as they can. The workers are trying to get as high wages as they can. The employers are trying to pay them as little as they can. So nobody's altruistic. Everybody's self-interested. But Smith has, uh, that's what the wealth of nations is full of, is all this discussion of the price mechanism and how the effect of everybody competing against everybody else leads the prices and the wages then to be at the right level that allocates uh, economic activity. So I would give Smith credit for establishing the mechanism uh, in a way that his predecessors don't. And now if I can uh, go back just a minute to our previous conversation, I think the reason this mattered so much and why Smith's contemporaries understood the force of his contribution is precisely that they had all been educated on Newton. And so they had, they had been trained to think in terms of system and mechanism. And uh, at some level, therefore, they must have understood that these people like uh, Mandeville and Nicole didn't have satisfactory explanations. And then when Smith came along, they we're able to see, yes, this person finally has given us a causal story, and he's identified the conditions under which this proposition holds, namely markets, and he's provided us with a mechanism, namely competition. I think that's why Smith's book was recognized, and it was immediately. You know, Smith died only 14 years after the uh, book was published, but in those 14 years, he became an international celebrity. The book went through, what, five, six uh, editions in English. There were all these translations. And so uh, the book clearly caught on and, and 
hit a nerve, and I think it's because he finally did provide the mechanism. Yeah. Um, right. And you also point out that he was a professor of moral philosophy. There was no economics science, not even really political economy, yeah, nobody, right? Nobody, yeah, no, no, nobody had the word uh, economics at the time. It hadn't, hadn't been thought of. Smith was a professor of moral philosophy, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, and the moral behind that, it, the mechanism is, uh, you know, and, and, and theologians and, and religious people have recognized human nature uh, for, 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 for a long, long before evolutionary psychologists came on the scene. You know, we have this selfish nature. Given that reality, how can we structure society to attenuate the inner demons and, and, and accentuate the better angels and... And, and tune the dials such that when people pursue their self-interest, the rest of us all benefit in some way. That's kind of the the, 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 the moral element behind it. We, 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 we want some moral element in there. How can we structure society to be better off? Yes, although remember that these were 18th century figures, and the word moral in the 18th century had a lot to do with society uh, you know, in, in my previous book, which was called The Moral Consequences of Economic Growth, I was using the word moral in the title in uh, a deliberately 18th century way to refer to the character of the society. And some people uh, looked at the title, The Moral Consequences of Economic Growth, and they, they said, well, where in the book have you shown that when uh, we have economic growth, people don't cheat on their wives or something like that. <laughs> right. Or, 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 or people, people don't engage in all sorts of personal nefarious practices. And I had to explain uh, that, yes, 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 I understand, of course, that this kind of individual morality is a lot of what we mean today. But I was using the word in this self-consciously 18th yeah. century sense yeah. in which what I meant was what Smith and Hume would have meant, namely the implications for the character of the society as a whole. And so when Smith taught moral philosophy, it was, of course, about uh, uh, individuals. He has a lot in his first book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. That's about behavior of individuals. But they also had this view that moral philosophy was a lot about the, the evolution and the character of society. Yeah, I think modern thinkers think Smith is just a a pro free market, keep the government out out of out of the economy entirely, and that business people should be free to do whatever they want. In fact, that's not what he said. He he has that famous passage where business people get together in private and can, you know conspire to you know basically rig the system in their their own favor. So we need government regulation to to kind of control at least well, the governor. I yeah. Well, I think it's more than that. First, uh, it's not just one passage in The Wealth of Nations <laughs> in yeah, which yeah. he says that. Remember, Smith was opposed to uh, impediments to the market mechanism, and therefore uh, he, that included not just government, but it included what he saw as the collusive, his word would have been combining, behavior of businessmen. And there are lots of passages in The Wealth mm. of Nations in which he says that any time business people get together, the first thing they talk about is how they can collude <laughs> in order to uh, cheat the public. And he says that any policy proposal that comes from businessmen ought to be viewed with great suspicion because these are people who uh, try to uh, cheat the public. He goes on and on about this. But the other point is, I, you know, I think Smith has been very unfairly treated uh, by uh, conservatives. Uh, conservatives often make out that Smith thought the market mechanism was some kind of hothouse flower that was so fragile it had to be defended against any possible encroachment. And that's just not what Smith thought. Smith was impressed with the astonishing robustness, that was his word, mm. robustness of the market mechanism. And for that reason, he was uh, willing to uh, support all sorts of interferences with the market mechanism when he thought they had a good purpose. So just to cite a few, uh, Smith was in favor of progressive income taxes. Mm. 
Now, my guess is that if you, next time you see somebody wearing an Adam Smith necktie, <laughs> if you walk up to the person and point at his necktie and say, oh, I'm so pleased to see that you're in favor of progressive <laughs> income taxes, I'm guessing the person won't have any idea what you're talking about right. because the person probably hasn't read the book. But Smith was in favor of progressive income taxes. He was in favor of luxury taxes. Mm. There's a passage in the book in Wealth of Nations in which he says that people who drive around or are driven around in luxury carriages ought to have to pay a special tax on those. And then the revenue from the tax, he said, should be used to alleviate the misery of the poor. Mm. Uh, Smith, for example, was in favor of much tighter uh, regulation on banks than anything you and I have seen in our lifetimes in the mm. United States. So he was willing to support all of these things. And of course, he understood that they interfered in some way or another with the market mechanism. But he thought the mechanism was just so powerful, it could do its job despite these. And therefore, if there was a good public purpose, he was for it. Yeah. I guess in modern language, we'd say he was against crony capitalism, in which uh, people are rent-seeking to get favors just to benefit their industry or their corporation. Yeah, he was against crony capitalism. He was against collusion. Again, the business community doesn't talk about it very much, but you could think of Smith as the father of antitrust hmm. uh, policy, the passages in the Wealth of Nations you were pointing to uh, support that. Uh, he was against government-granted uh, monopolies. He was against a lot of these old medieval uh, restrictions that didn't have any purpose, things like guild regula regulations that restricted who could work in which trades yeah. and all of yeah. that. He was against <clears throat> these, I don't know if you ever saw the British film uh, series, uh, Downton Abbey, mm, Yeah, uh, from a few years ago. Remember, that was all about the entail placed on the estate of mm. the uh, nobleman who was at the heart of it. Smith was against uh, these things in the same way that he wanted laborers to be able to work at whatever they wanted to do. He wanted people who owned property to be able to dispose of the property in whatever way they wanted. And he, he just saw these restrictions as having no purpose. But when there was something like, let's have banking regulation, well, he was for it. Right. Yeah, I think you've just given a, an answer there to that question I asked at the beginning. How, how is it possible 81% of white evangelicals voted for Trump? Uh, they're not voting for a moral character. They're not looking for one person to be a moral person to stand up there and be our president. They're looking for the moral, what they consider to be the moral structure of society, which is these you know conservative values of of a pro-life on the abortion issue, which Trump, you know, famously spoke out more than any Republican candidate in, in a long time. And uh, I was at a debate with uh, Dinesh D'Souza, the public uh, intellectual conservative Christian, uh, last year, about a month before the election. And I asked him this, you know, if we were, this was in a church, <laughs> you know, how, how could you people vote for Trump? And it's like, we don't care what he does personally, you know, his, his, his failed marriages and his affairs and his failed businesses. He's getting us the judges we want and the policies we want to construct a conservative worldview in America. So that's what you mean by Smith's concept of morality, of a moral, not Trumpianism, but just that, that, that we want to structure society in a way that gives us a moral worldview that we think is the right one. Yeah, I think that's right. And um, as I emphasized in my previous book, a lot of these things uh, that are uh, moral features of society, I think, at least in America, are not very much questioned. So the dimensions of society that I focused on in that book are things like openness of opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, do we want the young people who are able to uh, get ahead uh, to be just the sons and daughters and nieces of nephews of people who are already at the top? Or do we want opportunity available more broadly? Uh, I think in terms of uh, tolerance, an uh, important uh, 18th century Enlightenment concept, uh, tolerance with respect to what? Well, as Americans, you and I would think about race, but we would also think about religious and ethnic uh, prejudice. Think about generosity. I've already emphasized 
Smith has a lot in his work about generosity to the poor. Uh, I, I would think about uh, uh, commitment to democratic institutions. I think this is all about, this is now I'm deliberately taking us away from the narrow uh, evangelical focus on uh, uh, on abortion and same-sex marriage and all that. But I think there are plenty of, and, and I'm taking it away from that because uh, those are, of course, things on which Americans disagree quite profoundly. Mm -hmm. But there are plenty of aspects of the moral character of society uh, that I don't think are much under dispute these days. No, I don't hear a lot of people say, oh, yes, no, 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 we want to make sure that the only people who get opportunity are, uh, are uh, just those who are, connected to those at the top or we 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 don't want to have democratic institutions that that you don't hear much of that right, in America right. thank goodness although you do have those statistics uh that I pulled from from my review that you quote in the last chapter uh here I'm writing the link between the religious belief and individual agency and a resultant ec economic success is what energizes most american protestants today as Friedman notes in a statistical pan to the power of ideas where 30% of Americans believe that luck plays a substantial role in determining one's income, 54% of comparatively non-religious Europeans hold that view. Only 26% of Europeans think that the poor are that way because they are lazy, compared to 60% of Americans who endorse that view. Finally, into Friedman's point about agency and prosperity, 71% of Americans think that the poor can lift themselves out of poverty through hard work, compared to only 40% of Europeans. So let's take that and then tell us how that derives from a religious worldview about agency, pushing back against this predestinarianism. Yes, uh, I mentioned before that <clears throat> my core argument in the book is that the people who gave us modern Western economics 250 years ago were powerfully influenced by the religious thinking of their time, and I didn't mention what the religious thinking of their time was, and now you've given me an opportunity yep, to yep. do that. I think what enabled Smith and Hume and their contemporaries to come to the thinking they did was the movement away from belief in Calvinist predestination. Uh, there are a whole variety of elements of that, but the ones that I emphasize in uh, the book are primarily a new, <clears throat> more benign, more optimistic view of the human character. Cal Calvin famously stated that all individuals are born utterly depraved <laughs> and yeah. unable to do good in the world and unable to tell good from evil. That's these virtually direct quotations from Calvin. And then especially the idea of predestination. Calvin taught that whether any individual was to be saved in the afterlife or condemned to eternal punishment uh, was a decision made not only before the person was born, but even before the world was created. Yeah. And it therefore followed, followed that no choice that a person could make, no uh, decision, no action could have any causal bearing on the determination of whether that person was to be saved or not. Now, Smith and Hume lived in a time and in a place where there was a key change uh, under going on. People were now rejecting uh, these uh, Calvinist ideas. Uh, the, both the time and the place are important. The movement away from predestinarian Calvinism in the English-speaking Protestant world was a kind of rolling uh, debate. It was at its height in England in the latter part of the 17th century. It was at its height in Scotland in the uh, early to middle decades of the 18th century. And that's very important because this is the period when Smith and Hume and their contemporaries were coming into young adulthood and therefore forming what I call following Einstein their worldview and then interestingly for us as Americans, uh, this debate was at its height in uh, America in the latter half of the 18th century and on into the early part of the 19th century. So uh, in this world in which uh, religion was so central, so pervasive, 
and these religious ideas were so hotly contended, uh, Smith and Hume uh, just heard this debate all around them, even though they weren't religious figures. And as a result, they were influenced and their worldview took on uh, this uh, idea of a more benign uh, uh, view of the human character. Humans are born with goodness and humans are able to know what's right and what's wrong. And humans are able to do uh, what's good in the world. And especially humans are uh, able to take action that make decisions that uh, affect their ultimate spiritual destiny, and therefore, why not in the secular realm? In effect, they were secularizing, I think, hmm. the dominant new economic and uh, not dominant new religious ideas of their time. The two key words on the cover of your book there, religion and capitalism. By religion, you mean Protestantism pushing back against Calvinism and then branching off from there to different sects like Baptists or Methodists or whatever. Um, and that belief in human... Well, well to slow down, if, 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 if I may slow us down again, there, this is all within Protestantism. Yeah. So Calvin was a, Pro, Calvin was a Protestant. The right. Calvinists were Protestant. So the issue isn't Protestantism pushing back on anything. This is the question of what kind of Protestants mm. did these people want to be. Mm. It's all within Protestantism, simply because that's the world in which uh, people have uh, lived. So some people who've started to read the book have asked me things like, well, how about the Catholics? Uh, how mm. about the Jews? Uh, mm. you, you know, I, I it so happens I know a little about uh, the Catholic economics. It won't surprise you that I know something about uh, Jewish views on economics. Uh, but that's not the world in which these mm. people live. These right. people lived in the English-speaking Protestant world, and that means the world of Calvin and the put then the pushback against him. Yeah, good point. Then the other word, capitalism. So let's talk about what that meant to them. You know, Smith's book also pushed back against mercantilism. And, uh, you know, people think the name of his great book is The Wealth of Nations. That's not the title. The title is The Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. It's a very scientific book. So what did he mean by wealth and what was its cause and, and nature? That's a very interesting point. I'm glad you raised it. Uh, by wealth, Smith meant more or less what we do. He meant the standard of living of the population. When he referred to the wealth of nations, he meant what's their standard of living. Now, it's important to note that that was a new concept, and he got it from Hume. There's a famous essay by Hume suggesting, uh, this is so long before uh, Smith wrote, Hume, Hume was uh, a dozen years older and was in many ways uh, Smith's intellectual mentor, but, but Hume had written this essay saying that what matters for uh, what we should call wealth is not the amount of gold and silver sitting in the treasury's vaults. That's what the mercantilists thought. Hume thought what mattered and what we should construe as the wealth of nations is whether people are living comfortably or not. And Smith just took that and then used it as the title of his book. And so today, if uh, you tell somebody that a book titled The Wealth of Nations is all about whether people are living comfortably or in poverty, the person is likely to look at you and say, yeah, okay, what else is new? What, <laughs> right. what, what else might you mean? But um, in, especially when Hume wrote his essay, and even when Smith then used this concept for the title of his book, this was new thinking. Yeah, I also think of the wealth of nations as defending the consumer point of view as opposed to the producer's point of view. In, in other words, if we're going to have government policy favoring producers at the expense of consumers is not the way to increase the wealth of a nation. It's to make it better for consumers, whatever. And so competition between uh, corporations and therefore breaking up trusts it is a measure toward increasing the wealth of the nation. By whatever measure they used at the time today, I guess we use per capita GDP. I'm not sure how. I forget how Smith measured that at the time. Yeah, no, but but you but again, you've made a very important point because there's a passage in the Wealth of Nations, actually several, where Smith says that the sole purpose of production 
is is to facilitate consumption. Right. And production production that does not lead to consumption, uh, at least ultimately, has has no purpose. So, in what's sometimes a uh, political debate between consumers and producers, it's very clear that Smith was on the side of the consumers. That that's what he thought the point was. Yeah. I made a point in, in one of my earlier books that, you know, when Reagan uh, bailed out the, well, bailed out the Harley Davidson motorcycle, he put tariffs on Honda and Yamaha. And at the time, this was in the 70s and I was riding motorcycles. I noticed that the price of motorcycles, Yamahas and Hondas went up. And I thought, how is this helping me? This I could see that it helps Harley Davidson and their 3,000 employees or whatever they had. Uh, but But that's not what capitalism is supposed to be. It's supposed to be me, the consumer, the little guy. Yeah, I think that's right. Smith was, of course, uh, in favor of free trade, although he was sympathetic to what we call the in- infant industry mm. argument. Mm. You know, if you had some industry that was just starting out and needed for a while to be protected against foreign competition in order to allow it to develop fully, he, he understood that. Yeah. But uh, overwhelmingly, Smith was in favor of free trade, not uh, not protectionism. And again, his view is that if you have a mature industry that gets protectionism, this isn't uh, advancing the interests of the consumers. This is just enab- enabling the uh, the producers to enjoy excess profit. In effect, uh, protectionism is just a, uh, a soft form of giving a government-granted monopoly. A government-granted right. monopoly says nobody can sell this good in our country except you. And by contrast, the tariff says, okay, other people can sell it in addition to you, but they have to be at a disadvantage from you. The two are the two concepts are yeah. the same. Uh, just to, to give a, a modern example of your infant industry, w- would tax breaks for people that buy Teslas be a government boost to Elon Musk to help him get started to compete against other automobile manufacturers because it's so hard to get to, to produce cars. Well, I don't. Uh, well, I guess there are two two issues here. Uh, one is whether other people were producing electric cars abroad, mm-hmm. and uh, Musk needed to be protected uh, from those and. I'm just ignorant on the subject. Yeah. I don't know no, whether there. I don't think that's the we're, case. We're, yeah, I, I don't know but whether that's true. But here, the, the government, over, overarching government, is saying we we want to shift from fossil fuels to uh, renewables, and so electric cars is one of many we we want to encourage. So we're oh, going to. I, I see what. Yeah. So we're going to give people yeah, a break yeah, to make this choice. Yeah, no, no, no. That that's a quite different matter. That's not to do with infant industries, but yeah. that's to do with what economists call externalities. Yeah. Uh, and the uh, cars is a perfect example. Uh, you know, an externality is that if I didn't have a catalytic converter on my car, what would come out of the tailpipe uh, would uh, make a lot of other people worse off, not just me. And the market mechanism doesn't bring to bear on me the costs that I impose on other people. Uh, that's what we call an externality, and it's a prima facie case for government intervention. Now, Smith had the concept of externality. He did not have the word, so mm. there, he doesn't use doesn't have our vocabulary. But he absolutely had the con the the uh, the uh, concept. And the easiest place to see it is in his discussion of banking regulation. Hmm. Uh, I mentioned before that Smith uh, was in favor of very tight regulation on banks. This is not an accident. Uh, In 1772, Scotland had experienced its worst banking crisis in two generations. And Smith's book came out in 1776. So the banking discussion is a reaction against the banking crisis. And Smith is describing the restrictions that he'd put on banks. And then he makes a very interesting statement. He says, I favor these restrictions for the same reason that I favor the rules that require firewalls 
mm. between the row houses mm. in Edinburgh. That's right. Well, you see, it's again, it, it's about as clear an example of an externality uh, as uh, as you can find. If you're going to have a bunch of row houses built of wood, then it's in the public interest to have uh, firewalls between them, and therefore the town of Edinburgh did. And we in economics today would just call that a clear example of an externality. Smith saw the concept, he just didn't have the word. Yeah. Yeah, that period of time, the Scottish Enlightenment in the late 18th, mid to late 18th century, and, and then our own Enlightenment in the creation of the United States and the Founding Fathers, it's just the more you read of their work, it's just astonishing how brilliant these guys were and how deeply read in the liberal arts and all fields that they were. And then you compare that to today's politicians, it's just embarrassing. <laughs> you look at these wingnuts at the Capitol Dome with their costumes saying, this is our 1776 moment. It's like, oh my God, you know, these guys would be rolling over in their graves. <laughs> anyway, that's just a, a sidebar. Um, I want to I push a little bit more on this, the idea of agency, human agency, and how important that is to capitalism. You have to, be, you have to assume people are free to make choices. Within certain restrictions, of course, uh, but then, but but how does how did the theists at the time or, or, or believers, religious leaders, square that with this idea? Not just a predestination, because you covered that, but that if God created the whole universe and it's all, you know, he he's omniscient and omnipotent and knows what's going to happen. Uh, how how can you be held accountable for you, you choose Jesus as your savior or you don't? And if you don't, you're punished. Uh, you know how do how did they square that problem? Oh, I think you're going to have to ask a serious theologian okay. that, Michael. <laughs> okay. I mean, you, 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 you correctly pointed to the fact that there is a, uh, is a real tension there, and lots of aspects of religious belief uh, have serious tensions, and you, you, you've highlighted one, and this is something that, uh, I mean, I've, I've, in the course of the research for the book, I read a lot of what these theologians have to say, and uh, I, I think it's fair to say they struggled with it. They mm. struggled hard with it. Um, now, maybe some uh, theologians would say, oh, yes, 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 they just, they nailed that problem, mm. uh, but I don't think so. I think, uh, and, and incidentally, the whole notion of free will versus determinism is something that modern non-religious uh, philosophers yeah. struggle with all the time, too. Think yeah. about uh, Wittgenstein and Schopenhauer and all those figures of the uh, the 20th century. So uh, I, I think it's expecting too much to think that these theologians would have resolved that in a way yeah. that's easy to explain and easy for folks like us to understand. Yeah. Uh, but here I'm thinking of back to those numbers I gave from your book about Americans versus Europeans on the role of luck. Uh, I mean, American cons modern conservatives embrace this kind of just world theory of the way lives turn out. If you're poor, it's, you just didn't work hard enough and you weren't, weren't creative enough. You're just not smart enough or you're lazy or whatever. And if you're rich, it's because you worked hard and you rolled up your sleeves and you took risks and so on. Very much discounting the role of luck. Whereas I think of other religious belief, maybe Catholics or, 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 or European secularists are more inclined to, to recognize the role of luck. Just, you know, if you're born into a, uh, a, in Somalia or, you know, inner city Chicago or something to a single mom, you know, who's poor and, and, and on drugs or whatever, you're just not going to like be able to pull yourself up by your bootstraps like somebody else who's born into a you know, a middle class family or something like that. Uh, so, so just kind of give me your thoughts on how, because Smith was a moral philosopher, and and they thought about these things. Of you know, uh, to what extent do we have a moral obligation to help people who just have bad luck? They were, they didn't choose their parents; they just got bad, bad luck like that. Well, I think you have two. There, there are two strands interwoven. I think in the difference between Americans uh, and uh, Europeans. Uh, one, as you point out there, and as I was emphasizing before, there is a religious element to it. I think in the movement away from predestinarian Calvinism, Protestants uh, adopted or came into 
uh, a view that emphasized the possibilities for human agency. Now, the religious debate over human agency was all about uh, the ability to effect our spiritual uh, well-being by our choices and actions. But then this spills over. And if once you believe that it's possible to uh, make choices, take actions that achieve your spiritual salvation, it's then not very hard to uh, bridge that over to think that it can affect your human destiny as well. The second element, though, and here we get into the difference between Smith and modern Americans, uh, is that the United States was a very different country, uh, especially in the early days from the Scotland or England in, that, that Smith uh, knew. Uh, I have a long section in the book in which I talk about the early American Republic and what it was like, for example, when uh, Alexis de Tocqueville visited here from France in the 1830s. And this was uh, this must have been a period of extraordinary economic activity, uh, not just activity, but opportunity. The view was that, now remember, they were talking only about white males. <laughs> they're, they're not yeah, talking about yeah. the, 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 the African slaves. And for the most part, they're not talking about women either. But there really was a view that among the white males, uh, anybody could uh, could make it. You know, if you didn't like your the if you didn't like what you were doing, you could always move two hundred miles west and stake out some farmland mm -hmm. and start off as an independent farmer. As late as the Civil War, uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln has this famous speech. I quote from it in the book, in which he says that anybody who spends his entire life working for somebody else as opposed to being an independent farmer or businessman, uh, must uh, be doing that because of some kind of moral uh, character, or it must be his personal choice. And that's because when Lincoln was growing up in the 1830s and 40s and on into the 50s, uh, that's the way the American, uh, that's the Amer way the American economy was located. It wasn't until the 1890s that America ceased to have a Western frontier. So I think uh, uh, that's, just, that's just not the world Adam Smith uh, knew. Scotland was terribly poor. It was a feudal class society. If you were born the son of a, uh, of a crofter peasant, well, <laughs> tough luck. That's what you were gonna, that's what you were gonna be. Uh, Smith was born into a middle-class intellectual family. Smith um, Hume was from the minor aristocracy. So, uh, you know, there's a reason uh, Americans think uh, the in this way that's different from Europeans. And I, ha I think it, it has a lot to do with the early character of our society. Now, when you talk about uh, today, if you're born to a, a, a black single mother in the slums of Chicago uh, and so forth, that what you're pointing to is that we don't live in 1830s America anymore. Mm. We yeah. live in a very different society, and therefore uh, we're entitled to ask whether the presumptions that we have inherited from 1830s America uh, mm. are still useful, uh, good presumptions for us to have. That's a very interesting debate, but I think lots of our uh, presumptions are inherited from the 1830s. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, you're right. Post-millennialists taught that human beings can win Jesus' favor by carrying out social reforms like the abolition of slavery, workers' rights, children's rights, etc. So let's talk about this uh, tension you have in quite a bit of your book between the prosperity gospel and the social gospel. That, to me, is super interesting. Yeah, the uh, this is something that uh, came in in the uh, American Protestant uh, world and starting in around the 1880s and then especially on through the 90s and into the early decades of the new century. Uh, everybody understood that the American economy was thriving, and it was. This was a period of, of terrific economic growth, uh, more or less. And yet there was widespread poverty, and it seemed to be getting worse. And people didn't understand that. Now, among economists, this attracted attention too. Uh, Henry George, a famous economist of the period, 
uh, wrote a book titled Progress and Poverty. Mm -hmm. Uh, Once again, titles matter. And we were talking before about Adam Smith's uh, title. The relevance of Henry George's title is that the whole notion that you could have poverty continuing in the middle of all this economic progress that that was new to people. I think Henry mm. George's book was something like 1879. Well, uh, the question then was, what were the nation's Protestant churches supposed to do about this? And under the leadership of men like Washington Gladden and Walter Rauschenbusch and many of these other great figures, uh, folks thought that Uh, the country really needed to take a more proactive uh, stance in this. They recognized this was something the churches couldn't do on their own, uh, so they they knew it required government action, but they thought that the country's Protestant churches ought to play a key role in directing this new um, policy orientation that they called for. And especially in the writings of Walter Rauschenbusch, this came to be called the social gospel. By contrast, uh, there were other Protestant clergy at the time. I point to people like uh, uh, Henry Ward Beecher in New York, uh, Russell Conwell in Philadelphia, William Lawrence here in Boston. Uh, There were other Protestants who said, no, 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 this 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 isn't what we're supposed to be doing. That's that's that that's not what we were that's not what we signed on for when we were <laughs> ordained as ministers and they were opposed and in a phrase that was taken not but from a clergyman but from a famous essay written by Andrew Carnegie uh, this group came to be called the gospel of wealth and this tension between the gospel of wealth crowd and the social gospel crowd uh, came to dominate this uh, period uh, again from the call it from the 1880s right up to about uh, World War One, and this was a, a an ongoing disagreement within the country's Protestant establishment. But it also spilled over for very important uh, implications for economics, precisely because even the gospel of wealth crowd understood that the churches could not do this on their own. They wanted the churches to supervise, to inspire, to lead. But they knew they couldn't do the job on their own, and so it had to involve government policy. Hmm. Yeah, to use a modern example, uh, current conservatives will say, well, we're not the party of greed and selfishness, and we really believe in charity and goodwill and helping people. We just think it should be done privately through churches and charities, not the government, because the government, the moment the government steps in, it's no longer a moral issue. I'm going to take money from you, earning it through taxes, and give it to these people over here. Uh, and, 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 but but the counter to that then is I'm reading you if I'm reading you correctly is that that's never going to do it that's just not enough there's not enough money we need the government to help out it with charity and so forth and take care of the poor we have a moral obligation so to that extent we need to spend time and money supporting politicians and 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 political policy that leads to that. Well, this is clearly a matter on which Americans disagreed then, and they disagree now. Uh, There is this strong uh, voluntarist aspect of certain strands of uh, Protestantism. And exactly as you say, there are people who who say, look, I I believe there are many Protestants, for example, who tithe, who say, I absolutely believe I should give to the poor uh, 10% of my income. But I want to do that as a voluntary act. It uh, it loses all of its religious significance if uh, I'm doing it because the government compels me under threat of imprisonment to pay my taxes. So uh, Americans disagree uh, on this. I certainly am in favor of the social safety net that we have here in the United States. If I had my choice, I would make it uh, a more robust social safety net than Mm. we have uh, presently. And I certainly believe that uh, we need uh, government to uh, put that uh, in in place simply because we live in a different society than Mm. they did. uh, They they did years ago. Incidentally, even Adam Smith, as I mentioned in some of the examples I gave before, even in Scotland 250 years ago, uh, Smith was in favor of uh, mentioned the example of luxury taxes mm. uh, 
the proceeds of which would go, I mean, go toward uh, paying poor relief. That would be like saying that today people who drive around in BMWs and Mercedeses ought to pay a special tax on those mm-hmm. with the proceeds going to uh, relieving uh, the poor. And uh, Smith was also very much in favor of uh, education funded by the state. Yeah. Uh, so uh, he had that. But uh, leaving aside Smith, I think we live in a very different society today. And the need for and rationale for a social safety net, I think, is uh, much greater than it was then. But to repeat, this, these, these are issues that uh, the public uh, disagrees about, and that's what democracy is supposed to be for. You you win the election, you get to impose your, your policy choices. All right, so you got us up to about, I'd say, the 1920s. So what happens with the Great Depression and, uh, and, and the New Deal and Roosevelt, and then and that'll take us up to post-World War II and the, and the pushback against that by conservatives? Well, uh, the 1920s and 30s is an interesting period. You mentioned Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt was very clearly a product of the social the uh, social gospel movement in the uh, in the Protestant churches. Roosevelt was educated at Groton School. Uh, Mm. He remained for the rest of his life close to uh, Reverend Endicott Peabody, who was the founder and for many years headmaster at Groton, and uh, Peabody was very much a social gospel uh, figure, and this comes uh, clear. There's a very interesting uh, recent biography of Roosevelt by a man who I never met and who I think is no longer living, but I'm not sure about that, James Wolverton, that emphasizes the connection to uh, to uh, Reverend Peabody and to the social gospel. Mm. But Now, the other side of this is that the uh, effect of the uh, depression and uh, the rise of fascism in Europe, I think, knocked a lot of the force out of the social gospel movement. The social gospel was an optimistic worldview. It was, uh, as I mentioned before, it was a reaction to widespread prosperity. And what these people were like Rauschenbusch and Washington Gladden were saying is, yes, we've achieved all this prosperity, but it's it's wrong to have so much poverty in the middle of prosperity. Everything is going right. It's not fair that uh, Americans have to live in these kind of poor conditions, so many of them. Well, once uh, we had uh, the Depression, and uh, again, the rise of fascism in Europe, the whole optimistic underpinning of the social gospel went away. And this had something to do with the opposition to Roosevelt, but it also, uh, I think, had a deep, uh, a deep effect on the social gospel. And behind that, the mainline Protestant churches. This is the period when the mainline churches, by which I mean uh, denominations like the Episcopalians, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, the Congregationalists, and so on, started to lose out to the evangelicals, people mm. like uh, Baptists, the Christian denominations, and so forth. And that movement away from the uh, pro- the mainline denominations toward the evangelicals is still very much in force uh, today in the United States. Interestingly, it's not so much a matter of, oh, identification. If you, you have to be very careful in these, re- looking at these religious polls. If you simply ask people questions like, with what denomination do you identify? Mm. Um, you know, the erosion for the Episcopalians uh, and so forth has not been so great. But it's clear that a lot of the energy has gone out of those mainline denominations. And by contrast, the energy in the Protestant uh, world these days is very much in the evangelical yeah. sphere. And they, the evangelicals are the heirs of the people who are not in favor of the social gospel. These are people who very much emphasize the voluntarist aspects of Protestantism. Uh, they didn't want uh, the 
government to be um, running a big social safety net. Not then, not now. Yeah. All right. So that uh, we defeated fascism. So World War II is over, but now communism is on the rise. And so now we get to uh, names and, and, and titles that our listeners will be relatively familiar with. Uh, J. Howard Pugh, this I presume is the same Pew as the Pew Modern Pew Research Organization. Dwight Moody, the Moody Bible Institute. Charles Fuller, Fuller Theological, right down here in Southern California. Uh, Byman, Byman Stewart's Biola, I've been there, by the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. I mentioned George Pepperdine, because I went to Pepperdine, who dedicated to teaching, quote, under conservative fundamental Christian supervision with an agenda of conservative, laissez-faire economic policies. Wow, now the kind of modern worldview is starting to come into focus here. Uh, The rise of libertarianism, William F. Buckley's God and Man at Yale, and his creation of the National Review, Barry Goldwater's, even his Barry Goldwater's book, The Conscious of of a Conservative. I mean, conscious, that's like a religious word used in the context of an economic idea of conservatism. Uh, Friedrich Hayek, Ludwig von Mises, Ayn Rand, Billy Graham, Ronald Reagan. Now we start to see how Jesus became a conservative, even though he said we're supposed to take care of the poor. And and a rich man will not get into heaven like a camel can't go through the eye of a needle. When did Jesus become a conservative? Well, you kind of outlined that. So walk us through, say, post-World War II, rise of communism to, you know, now. Well, I will do that, but let me just... I. Uh, take one piece of exception to something okay. you said. I yeah. always, uh, I, I always have a bit of a hiccup when I hear somebody refer to Barry Goldwater's book, okay. "The Conscience of a Conservative." Um, uh, Barry Goldwater no more wrote that book than I wrote <laughs> Moby Dick. Uh, the book was written. Uh, the The book was written by Brent Bozell, who happened to be Bill Buckley's brother-in-law. <laughs> That's right, uh, and it's, an, uh, it, it's a it, Brent Bozell was a very talented man. Uh, it's either his son or his grandson. I can't remember which is uh, very active today in conservative politics. Mm. Uh, Brent, the Brent Bozell, uh, who was Buckley's brother-in-law, was a very talented man, a very uh, very good writer. But he wrote the book. And there's no evidence that uh, Goldwater even read the book before it was published. <laughs> That's so, funny. So I, in in deference to Mr. Bozell, okay. I always uh, I always uh, hiccup a bit when somebody <laughs> refers to it as Goldwater's book. That's now, funny. Uh, I found this whole coming together in the middle of the last century of religious conservatism and uh, economic conservatism in the United States to be very, uh, very interesting and important for today. And you rightly cite lots of these colorful figures whose names I hope would be familiar to many of your listeners. Uh, My interpretation of how this happened is that both groups came to understand that they were facing an existential threat and from the same enemy, namely the threat of world communism. The uh, religious conservatives came to understand, I think correctly, that communism was the antithesis of Western religion, at the same time that the business conservatives came to understand, I also think correctly, that communism was the antithesis of Western-style free market capitalism. And although we today uh, have trouble putting ourselves in their shoes, to use an Adam Smith uh, phrase, uh, if you go back to the 1940s after World War II, and then on into the 1950s, uh, I don't know how old you are, Michael, but I can tell you that I remember in uh, elementary school and even in high school going through drills Mm -hmm. in which we were uh, made to shelter ourselves Mm -hmm. underneath our desks in case uh, the Russians, meaning the Soviets, uh, were to attack the United States uh, with nuclear uh, weapons. 
Now, even even that sounds silly today, you know. I did if have to do that. Sets off I'm, and, I'm ten years behind you. I'm sixty six. So I, in grammar school, we did that. Okay, you, so yeah, yeah. So you you had that as well. I mean, at one level, it's almost laughable today. Yeah, the whole yeah. notion that if somebody uh, sets off a nuclear weapon nearby, you're going to accomplish anything by hiding under a wooden <laughs> desk. You know, come on, give us a <laughs> yeah. break. But uh, it just shows what the mood of the time was. Yeah. And so uh, here you have these two different groups in American society, and in ways that I lay out in the book, uh, religious conservatives and uh, uh, business conservatives had, uh, had uh, you know, there, there, there were resonances between the two groups before. But I think it was really in the middle of the 20th century when the country faced this existential threat, and the two groups came to realize that they were fighting an enemy in common. And as often happens when two groups who don't necessarily have a lot in common come to understand that they're fighting uh, the same enemy, this really brought them together. And then of the people that I mention in the book, all of these people whom you uh, name, but to me, the two key figures were uh, Billy Graham on the uh, religious side and Bill Buckley. Uh, Buckley wasn't a, a businessman. He was an uh, intellectual, but he was very much an intellectual who spoke for uh, the business community. So I think it was through the uh, work of Graham and Buckley that these two movements came together. And in effect, they've been together ever since. Yeah. Yeah, no, I love Buckley's show Firing Line. I just could not get enough of it. He's such a colorful intellectual um, but, uh, but, but in terms of this kind of social gospel, incidentally, yeah. I was, inc incidentally, if I may interrupt, I was on, I was on Buckley. I was the guest on Buckley's firing oh line. Oh my God. How uh, great was that? Was. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. When, when, when my first, uh, book for a popular audience called the uh, day of reckoning, uh, came out, uh, Buckley had me on the show. And so that's now something you and Buckley, uh, you and Bill Buckley had in, uh, uh, have in common. It's funny. Two degrees of separation. <laughs> right. So, uh, again, marrying these these two concepts. So we should probably call it godless communism. And that's why you get these two forces. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Um, so, you know, the uh, I was. I'd forgotten how influential and huge Billy Graham was, but you know, you cite statistics in there, you know, tens of thousands of people, hundred thousand people would come to his his rallies. You know, you just don't see anything quite that big today. Uh, maybe someone like a, a Joel Olstein with his mega church in Texas would be close to something like that. He's, by the way, a prosperity gospel. God wants you to be rich. I don't know if you know that improbably named guy Creflo Dollar. You see him on TV all the time. <laughs> God wants you to have a two thousand dollars suit. He really does. <laughs> it's just so funny. Um, but uh, right, so the, the the kind of wedding of these two uh, in, in order to push back against uh, godless communism. What happens after nineteen eighty nine, nineteen ninety, and the fall of the Soviet Union? Well, again. Uh, one of the concepts that I draw on uh, repeatedly in the book is uh, from Max Weber, uh, the idea of a catalyst. And uh, in Weber's view of the influence of religious thinking on economic thinking, which has some points of tangency with mine, but uh, is mostly the other direction because Weber emphasized the importance to him of belief in predestinarian Calvinism. I'm the other way, so I more likely think of my ideas Weber upside down. Mm -hmm. But important to the Weber hypothesis was that this uh, effect on capitalism of the early belief in predestinarian Calvinism, he thought, persisted long after people ceased to believe that. Mm. And in Weber's book, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not an accident that the person he chose to exemplify his belief structure was Benjamin Franklin, who was, as I mentioned earlier on, Franklin was a deist. He, mm -hmm. I'm not sure he believed God in the modern sense anyway, uh, but Franklin uh, absolutely was not a predestinarian Calvinism. And the reason Weber chose him 
was precisely to illustrate that these ideas continue to have their force. Again, think back to the Keynes quotation with which you started. These ideas continue to have their force even after the initial religious impulse uh, that got them going has atrophied. Atrophied, And I apply that uh, Weber idea to my hypothesis as well. Uh, I think that the movement away from predestinarian Calvinism uh, created modern Western economics and what it created continues to be here long after the time when people stewed about the movement away from yeah. predestinarian Calvinism. It's gone. Now, bring it to this to bear on your question. Uh, the communist threat of the mid 20th century, I see as the same kind of catalyst. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm deliberately used. Uh, a technical word from chemistry, a catalyst is something that triggers a reaction, yeah. and then the catalyst disappears or is eaten up, but the reaction uh, becomes permanent. And I think it's, I think the threat of communism had the same effect as a catalyst. It triggered this reaction in which business conservatives and religious conservatives came together, and then the threat of world communism went away, but just as happens after a catalyst has done its work, the blending of religious uh, conservatism and, uh, and business conservatism uh, continued to be uh, with us, and it's still here today. Now, I, I'm not predicting that there's nothing in my book, incidentally, that's about uh, prediction, so <laughs> I have no idea whether it will still be here in 2050 or 2100, but here we... Here we are, the Soviet Union collapsed, what, 30 plus years ago, and uh, nobody uh, uh, nobody has undone this combining of the two forces. So I think it's, I think it's very much still here. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, your catalyst there in the 80s, the response in the 80s then was the rise of the moral majority, Reagan, and all that. Well, what happens when they, the commun threat of communism is gone? Well, you know, with the rise of conservative talk radio and then talk television on Fox News, all and then now social media, really anyone to you know, one millimeter to the left of dead center, someone like Joe Biden is now the left. This is, you know, this is Nancy Pelosi's communist America that's coming. You know? So they've, they've just kind of shifted over right up to the center line and said, these are all the enemy. Well, there's, you know, there, um, you know, we 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 stew a lot of, about the uh, vitriolic nature of um, uh, of uh, uh, American politics today, and it is, of course, true, and we can't uh, deny that what happened last month uh, was uh, absolutely unique in American experience. But if you take away last month's uh, insurrection. Um, the vitriolic nature of American politics has been with us for a very long that's time. That's true. Yeah, that's a good uh, you point. Go back, you go, I mean, even directed against some of the people whom we treat as almost holy figures in America, go back to what people said at the time about Thomas Jefferson, go back to what people said yeah. uh, before he was assassinated about Abraham Lincoln. Uh, I have a lot in my book about what people said about uh, Franklin Roosevelt. So uh, yeah, that's ours true. has always ours has always been a pretty rough and tumble form. And, and I, I don't mean rough and tumble in the sense of people do, staging an armed attack on the politic on on the capital. I'm, I'm divorcing. Yeah. I'm just yeah. holding that aside. But in terms of the verbal rough and tumble, uh, this is this is this is always this has always been a tough a tough place. How do you situate uh, modern libertarians, mo by modern I mean, say, go back 50 years or so, uh, who are not religious? You know, Ayn Rand was famously atheist, Friedrich Hayek, Ludwig von Mises, they were, I don't know if they were religious at all, but didn't come up in their theories. Uh, and libertarians seem to be split. Mostly they're not believers, they're nuns or they're atheists or whatever, it doesn't seem to matter. But they seem to hold common ground with con conservative Christians. Like, for example, I mentioned I was at Pepperdine. Uh, you know, everybody was reading Atlas Shrugged. I had to read Atlas Shrugged if I wanted to be in the in crowd. Okay. You know, and then they say, you know, and, and it was a pretty religious school. And then I, after I read it, I thought, you know, 
these are she's an atheist, right? You know that, right? Well, we don't care. We like her <laughs> her you know her, her philosophy. Uh, and so there seems to be those two tensions going on there. Well, I don't. Uh, I, th I think first place. I think the libertarian movement has evolved a great deal since uh, the time mm. when you and before that I was uh, in in college. Uh, I don't devote a lot of attention to libertarians in my book for the simple uh, reason that they are. Uh, such a small part of the American political landscape. Uh, in, in my book, in, in my book, I use a political co science construct uh, in which, if you picture just two issues, social issues and economic issues, and think about people who could be uh, liberal on economics or conservative on economics, liberal on social issues or uh, conservative on social issues. Uh, so you have four groups of people by the time you put together two by two. Yeah. Uh, people who are conservative on both social issues and uh, economic issues naturally find a home these days in the Republican Party. People who are liberal on both issues naturally find a home in the Democratic Party. But how about the people who are mixed? Now, the group that I spend a lot of attention uh, uh, devote a lot of attention to in my book because I find them very important are people who are conservative on uh, on on con conservative on social issues. They're opposed to same sex marriage. They're opposed to abortion and so forth and so on. But who have reason to be liberal in terms of their economics? And as I think I mentioned in the book. That group is uh, approximately 30% of the American electorate. Hmm. Now, you're pointing to the group in the opposite position, people who would be conservative on the economics, but who would be liberal in the uh, social uh, issues. We call them libertarians, typically. And... Uh, it turns out that group is only about 3% of mm. the American electorate. Uh, and so for that reason, I didn't have a lot to say about them. I find the 30% who are their polar opposites to be very important. Mm. Uh, and the libertarians are interesting. But once I saw what the polling data uh, looked like and saw what a small percentage that was, I then moved on. Yeah. So I think we can now answer that question. Why is it that 81% of white evangelicals voted for Trump? You mentioned uh, the book, What's the Matter with Kansas by Thomas Frank. Uh, in other words, why are people seemingly voting against their economic interests? And it's because they're voting for their, what, social interests or their their construction of a moral society, even though they're not going to benefit personally from a, a Trumpian presidency. Well, uh, the Thomas Frank idea is that because people don't vote for policies, we vote in America, we have a representative democracy, mm. not a direct democracy. So we don't vote for policies in much less individual ones. We vote for candidates. We vote perhaps for parties. Uh, and he, Thomas Frank's view is that <clears throat> people would love to be able to vote against, and again, this is the group I was highlighting before, People would love to be able to vote against abortion and for food stamps. Mm. Put it, uh, and uh, Frank's view is that the problem is they can't. They have to choose either the Republicans or the Democrats. Mm. And because it's the abortion and the same sex of marriage that's more important to them, they're led to give up their view on the food stamps. And I argue that that's not right. Or I, that that's too harsh. It's not sufficient, and the mm. reason it's not sufficient is that so many of these people, uh, if asked individual, just the individual question, "Would you like to see the social safety net expand?" They say no, <laughs> even though they are even though they are beneficiaries of it. If you ask, "Would you like a larger government that has more social programs?" They say no, we won't, we don't. And so I think uh, Frank's. Uh, view that they really would prefer a bigger social safety net. They're just getting dragged along mm. <clears throat> because they vote for Republicans because they're against abortion. I think that's seriously incomplete. 
It is true, of course, that in the United States, we don't vote individually for policies, but we do have public opinion polling. We have plenty of surveys. And as you note, I, I cite some of these in the book. And so we, we know what these people think on these issues. And it turns out that they are uh, against uh, many aspects of the social safety net. And I think they have this kind of voluntarist uh, Protestant uh, orientation that leads them not to uh, be in favor mm -hmm. of uh, government programs that are financed by uh, taxes that are not voluntary. There's also a separate dimension to it, uh, Michael, that we haven't gotten to yet, and so I'll introduce it and then leave it to you how much detail you want to go into. Uh, many of these evangelical groups are what are called pre-millennialist, and without going into a lot of detail that our listeners <laughs> presumably uh, don't uh, need. What this means is that they believe the second coming and therefore the end of the world <clears throat> as we know it will occur not only soon, but uh, will, sit, will occur before the biblically foretold thousand years. Mm -hmm. Think of it as metaphorical long period uh, of a better life. And so these, these groups tend to resist the idea of trying to improve the world. You mentioned, and this is a longstanding thing among American premillennialists. You mentioned before, for example, Dwight Moody in that group of names you mentioned, Moody is the oldest one. Uh, Moody, Moody came of age during the Civil War hmm. and uh, was a problem figure in the latter part of the 19th century. And Moody was absolutely opposed to any kind of uh, social programs to try to make the world better. His view is what Protestants were supposed to do was save souls and get people ready for the return hmm. uh, in the second cup, not to make things better. Now, here we go back to something that, again, uh, you pointed out that uh, lots of these religious views have tensions in them. And this is an example because there are some examples in which these premillennialist groups have been very strong supporters of social reform. You mentioned abolition of slavery. I don't think you mentioned it, but um, uh, the anti-whiskey movement mm. trying to prevent right. drunkenness eventually in the 1920s imposing uh, uh, prohibition. So there are some examples in which premillennialist groups do want to reform society, but for the most part, they don't. For the most part, they want to leave it to um, voluntarism and to focus on, as Moody would have put it himself, uh, save, saving individual souls. And I think this strong premillennialist uh, strand in uh, among American evangelicals is, uh, is, is a large part of the story of why they oppose many of these programs. Yeah. One of the other popular books everybody was reading when I was in college was Hal Lindsey's The Late Great Planet Earth, in which he kind of outlined everything that was happening in current events and how this was all prophesied in the Bible. And Henry Kissinger was the Antichrist and Israel was this and Russia was that and you know, the bear or whatever that was, and the other one was the eagle. And anyway, it was quite amusing when none of that happened. Uh, and he, but he just kept spinning, spinning it, and like uh, changing the names. Well, that's right. There is this strong strand again amongst premillennialists. Uh, the word for it is dispensationalism. Uh, dispensationalism was mostly invented by an Irish uh, cleric named John Nelson Darby, uh, who uh, then had a a very active ministry in the United States and Canada. Darby visited North America seven times. And a lot of uh, this is about, as you say, uh, relating real world events. It's a very literalist reading of scripture, especially the book of Revelation. And it's a lot about relating real world events to um, uh, to biblical uh, prophecies, a strong element of it, incidentally, which we still see 
is about predicting the end of the world. Uh, you know, uh, 200 years ago, uh, people did this all the time. The most famous one was uh, William Miller in <laughs> yeah. the uh, in, uh, 1840s predicted a specific day for the end of the world. And uh, in what I've always found an interesting <laughs> A turn of phrase among his followers. This was called the great disappointment yeah, right. when the world didn't didn't end. It's right. hard for me. I must. I'm I, I'm not a premillennialist <laughs> nor a dispensationalist, and so it's hard for me to picture being disappointed that the world didn't end. But they they were. But you see that uh, right through the present day. Uh, I have a picture in my new book, which I uh, took from the New York Times, showing a bunch of sponsored by the Family Radio Network, walking around Times Square in New York, predicting that uh, the world would end on, I think it was May 11th, 2011, or something like that. Well, uh, this this strand of thinking is uh, is very much still with it. It, it has, hasn't gone away. And you mentioned being amused by uh, many of these predictions not coming about. Uh, the faith is so strong among these people that they are not uh, typically deterred. I don't know personally any of the people who were predicting the end of the world in 2011, but uh, here we are. It's only 10 years later. I assume most of them are still uh, with us. And I'm guessing that if you asked any of them, uh, was your faith diminished by the fact that you stood there holding a sign in Times Square predicting that on such and such a day in 2011, the world would come to an end, and it didn't. I'm guessing uh, every one of them would, would answer you uh, and say, no, Dr. Shermer, my faith is not uh, diminished. That's true, and the uh, psychologist Leon Fessinger answered that question with his book, uh, When Prophecy Fails. He famously went to the top of the mountain with the local group in 1954, December 21st. This was a UFO cult that thought the mothership was going to come. And it, of course, the ship didn't come, and and, and the he thought the members might just go home and, and rebuild their lives. But no, they doubled down on their beliefs. So he called that cognitive dissonance. That's one explanation. Psychologically, when you have a conflict between your belief and the facts, uh, you spin doctor the facts to fit to keep the belief alive if it's super important to you. So it, what we're, we're seeing a little bit of this now with the QAnon believers. Some of them have abandoned it and said, "Boy, we got hoodwinked by Trump and his people." But 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 most of them are still thinking, "Well, Trump's going to come back." The latest one is he's coming back in March. He'll be back in the presidency on March 4th or something like that. Forget how they got that date. But but usually the spin doctrine goes along the lines of we miscalculated the end of the world. Uh, it was a test of our faith and we passed the test. So God spared us uh, or uh, I, I forget what some of the other ones are, but they always find a way to kind of make it fit. But the point for, for your book back to that is that if you believe the world is coming to an end soon, why bother with long-term policies to uh, save the environment or protect species or get off of uh, oil or you know help the poor or whatever? Yeah, I think, I think that's right. Incidentally, the uh, fact of people maintaining their faith after uh, things don't seem to go their way has, it, has its positive, uh, has its positive um, uh, features, you know, Picture our parents uh, in the middle of World War II in uh, 1942. It must have looked a bit bleak. Mm -hmm. And yet uh, here was Roosevelt telling them on the radio and fireside chats, we are going to prevail against uh, fascist uh, Europe. Think of all those uh, people in Britain who were listening to Churchill's uh, speeches saying, uh, you know, you know, we, we are going to fight here, we are going to fight there, we are yeah. never, ever going to surrender, and so forth. And in the same way that we were just pointing out that people who thought the world was going to come to an end in 1843 or in 2011, or what was your example, 1956 or something, uh, uh, were uh, proved uh, wrong, but they went right back to their beliefs, I uh, I, I think it, it's it, it's it's a good th it's a good thing that our parents weren't uh, yeah, discouraged yeah. in 1942. It's a it's a it's a good thing that the that the British uh, listened to Churchill and 
you know, there were there were plenty of uh, defeats of the English on the continent. Uh, uh, after you think about Dunkirk, it's yeah. uh, you you could easily imagine somebody him saying, "Well, you know, the, this guy is telling us we're going to win, and look look at we just ev- evacuated all of these people from the beaches in Belgium." <laughs> so there there are positive aspects of people's uh, uh, persisting in their beliefs. The over optimism bias can counter the negativity bias at times when we need that. Benjamin, I, I loved your book. Before I let you go, because I, I, I have since an eminent scholar here, I want to ask you about a, a few off the topic, off the book topics. So you were you're a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. So tell us the truth. You guys really run yes, the I world. Am. You, you you guys really run the world, right? <laughs> uh, out of out of my back pocket, Michael. <laughs> right. Out of my back pocket. <laughs> I was wondering if you might just put. 2020 into perspective. You've lived a long life and you've been actively in, in, involved in a lot of big, important uh, issues politically, economically, and so on. How do you put 2020 into perspective, I don't know, compared to Vietnam or Watergate or Iran-Contra or I don't know what uh, else you could compare it to? Well, by 2020, are you referring to the coronavirus? Well, the, well, the, Is that pa- what you mean? The, the, the pandemic, the economic collapse because of you know shutting down the economy, you know, the Russian hacking, the, you know, the 2020 election and all the Trump craziness. I mean, it's been quite a year. There's been like four or five major assaults on our society. Well, I won't talk about the ones that I don't pretend to know uh, much about, but the one I have thought a lot about is the inter relationship between the coronavirus pandemic and the economy. And mm. the way I think about this is, I think about it as a form of war. I mentioned World War II a moment ago, and uh, when you have a war, you have to focus your attention on fighting it, and it has economic costs. And if you look about the look at the amount of resources uh, we put put into World War II, it was enormous. If you look at the government deficits that we ran during World War II, they were enormous. If you look at the increase in uh, government uh, spending as a share of our national economy uh, that was uh, that was enormous so in all these ways i think it's uh, very comparable and uh, i'm hoping uh, i don't know about you I'm at this at, at as we sit here on uh, february uh, what is it february uh, 15 i've had my first i've had my first vaccination oh, you shot got it. my okay. second is scheduled <laughs> yeah as scheduled in in a few in a few weeks but uh, I think uh, this is not the time to ease up on efforts. This is not the time to say, yeah. oh, no, 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 we can't have the government spend anymore. We've done that. Again, go back to 1942. Suppose, suppose somebody in 1942 or 43 had said, look at what all the debt the government is issuing. Look at, look at the deficits we ran last year and next year. We, we have to get the government's budget back in order. Well, uh, the correct answer would have been and was to say, no, we're in the middle of this big thing and we're going to stop having the government spend so much and borrow so much after the war is over. Well, my view of the current economy is the same. We're going to, we, I hope, are going to stop with all of these government efforts only after the pandemic is over and i yeah. think we should just view view it as view it as if we're at war now uh, it's easier to it's easier to look at newsreels and see hitler and mussolini and say yeah yes yes that's <laughs> what we're at war with right. than to think we're at war with microbes we can't see right. but i think it's exactly the same thing yeah, the Saturday Wall Street Journal uh, opinion was editorial was showed that graph of the percentage of debt, percentage of GDP held in debt now 102% matching 1942 example you just gave. Uh but they had no uh criteria of like well when is too much? What, what what's the too much level? What's the number? And they said, well, one estimate is 90%, so we've passed 90%. Where do you get 90%? Why 90%? Um, and, and I do worry that, you know, just printing another $2 trillion and, and distributing it, uh, could lead to runaway inflation. But on the other hand, my monetarist theory friends tell me as long as the economy is expanding, we'll be okay. We can do this and recover like in the, in the graph showing after world war two, you know, that debt went back down. 
Well, I think uh, yeah, I think it isn't quite the same. And <clears throat> part of the reason, I mean, just to be specific, when we came out of World War II, the uh, government had a dollar and nine cents of debt outstanding for every got dollar of the national annual income. So the ratio was 109 percent. And over the next uh, three decades, that came down. It bottomed out at 26 cents on the dollar in 1976, I believe. Uh, but remember that an important part of how it came down was inflation. Uh, it, uh, we, you know, we're not talking about 10 percent inflation, much less 100 percent inflation. But we did have inflation often at the rate of two, three, four percent. And people uh, people didn't like it. So if we are to come out of this experience with a debt level compared to our national income that is of the order of what we had after World War II, we have to be very careful about saying, are we going to get rid of it the same way we got rid of world, the World War II debt, namely by slowly inflating a lot away? And if so, is that are we going to be content with that? Mm. Or are we going to say, no, 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 we tried that before. People didn't like inflation. We're not going to do it with inflation. And therefore, we have to come up with something different. I think that, I think that's going to be a very important choice mm. for our for our country. Now, one thing that does make it better is that at least at the moment, interest rates are very, very low. Mm -hmm. And so the government has the opportunity to fund this debt at extremely low interest rates. And of course, if you don't have to uh, pay interest on the debt, uh, then that's less uh, need for government spending and therefore the debt can go down faster. So the good news would be that uh, this time we can do it relying more on super low interest rates and less on inflation than last time. And for that reason, I think the government ought to be issuing very long-term bonds right now to lock in these super low interest rates because interest rates are very, very low at the moment. But what if they go up? Yeah. Then we've got a big problem. I want to ask you about UBI in the context of you were talking earlier Henry George's progress in pro poverty. Well, you know, if you if you fast forward a century and a half to where we are now from that book, we have way more progress and prosperity than ever, and yet we still have a, a lot of poverty and the income inequality is you know quite high. Gini index, I forget what it is now, but it's it's highest that it's been in decades or half a century or so. What do you think about a, a, a universal basic income? Just give everybody a thousand bucks. Now, a year ago, people thought that was crazy. And when Andrew Yang first brought that up in his candidacy, but here we just sent people checks of two trillion dollars and we're about to do it again. So apparently the government can print money and distribute the checks to people quite readily uh, without the stock market collapsing or anything like that. I am. I'm glad you raised the notion <clears throat> uh, together with universal income of what we just did with the uh, the stimulus and my concern about uh, UBI is the same as my concern about the uh, the stimulus program namely I don't see the point in sending money to people who don't need it so let's start with the stimulus and then work back um, in the original version of the Biden proposal the uh, checks were going to go to people in at least some money up the full checks of uh, what is it, uh, $1,400 uh, person uh, were going to go uh, to people with uh, family incomes up to $150,000. And then it would be scaled back, but you'd get at least something right up to $300,000. Uh, I don't see any purpose of that. No. If we're focused on. If we're, my view is if we're focused on poverty, let's address poverty. Let's not drown the poverty program by giving money to uh, virtually everybody in the country. Now, to uh, refer to the UBI, um, sending $1,000 to somebody doesn't uh, really, really do something. I would much rather have an income support problem, a program uh, with or without a work requirement. That's a very interesting one. Mm. Uh, either with or without work requirement, I'd much rather have one that targets on the poor. And we have lots of 
uh, programs targeted on the poor. In the course of the, our conversation, we've mentioned food stamps, but there's also supplemental income security. There's unemployment uh, compensation. There's subsidized housing. There are lots of these things. I would, uh, I, I'm, I'm not an expert in all these programs, so I leave it to others on how to design them. But through whatever combination of those programs, I'd much rather have those and focus on the people mm. who need it than say, well, we're not going to distinguish between who's poor and who's not, and therefore we're going to send send all this money to everybody. Because in, in order to make a difference, look, I think the poverty line for a couple of two is something like uh, you know, $25,000, $30,000. So if you're going to uh, raise people's uh, incomes above the poverty line, you're talking sending $25,000 uh, to each couple. Well, to send $25,000 a year to every couple in the United States, I mean, you know, now, now you're really talking about huge government spending yeah. programs. Yeah. And moreover it's, moreover, it's going to people who don't need it. Now, some people have said, well, we can devise schemes in which we're going to give the checks to everybody and then we're going to tax it back from the people who don't uh, need it. Well, that's better than, of course, than not taxing it back from those who don't need it. But somehow those schemes are uh, always, uh, what's the saying about the devils and the details or something <laughs> yeah, like yeah, that? Yeah. Uh, the, 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 those, the, those schemes always sound great in the two-sentence version, right? and they sound less great in the two page version right and by the time you get to the 20 page version yeah they are just full of problems so yeah. i would yeah. much rather use some version uh, an expanded version of what we've got uh, think targeting on the people who need it yeah can you foresee a day in the long run maybe 50 years 100 years from now uh when there is no poverty when when everybody has you know a decent place to live and three square meals a day and, and we've ended poverty you know the un's millennial goal is to end poverty by 2030 but that just means people are making more than two dollars and 30 cents a day or whatever it's not like they're now prosperous they're just not uh meeting that definition of poverty well maybe but in a century from now let's say everybody has the equivalent of what today would be like a hundred thousand a year or something like that uh is that possible, that kind of what's called Trekonomics, like a Star Trek thing, where there's no money because everybody has everything they need, and we just have replicators creating everything you want? <laughs> well, uh, you mentioned replicators, and that, that's a very, uh, <clears throat> a very useful insight. Uh, my current project, now that the, this uh, book that we've been discussing is done, is to think about the implications for our society and also our politics of the increasing reliance on robots and mm. artificial intelligence in uh, the economy. Yeah. And if you really want to speculate about what's going to be out there 100 years from now, I think there's a real chance that the whole nature of work as we know it, mm. will be fundamentally different because of, uh, again, the increasing reliance on robots and AI. And that may sound like an answer to a question that's different from the one you posed about eliminating poverty, but I don't think so. I think if we, if these scientific advances and our ability to use them do come along in the way that is at least foreseeable over the next hundred years. And we do, as a result of them, reinvent the notion of work. That, I think, puts us right back in the realm of having to rethink distribution and who's entitled to what. Mm. And it is entirely possible that uh, one aspect of this reinvention of who's entitled to what, which we're going to have to do if we have to reinvent the notion of work, mm. uh, is going to end up uh, eliminating uh, eliminating poverty. But now, now we're in a world of uh, prediction and all that, and I'm guessing some of my readers would would say, "Ah, yes, yes, yes. This man has been 
uh, <laughs> reading too carefully or maybe misreading too carefully the 20th chapter of Revelation or something <laughs> like that. So, so I, I, I don't want to push this too hard. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're working on that, though. I hope I hope that's your next book, because, you know, this is the point Andrew Yang made about um, AI and, say, self-driving cars and trucks. I forget what the number was, but it's like 300,000 people or maybe it was 3 million, I don't know, would be put out of work. And what are you going to do? Oh, you can't, three, million, three yeah, million. Yeah, you can't tell these truck drivers, well, just go learn to program computers because that's the future because they can't do this at this point in their lives. They need, uh, you know, a UBI to help them transition to help society transition over the next several decades to this world you're describing. No, I think that's right. And again, if you if you look at uh, some of the possibilities for not just robots, but AI, I think it isn't just the truck drivers. There are an awful lot of elements of our society that absorb the effort, but also provide remuneration for millions and millions of people. And if those become unnecessary, there's just a... a, a, a a major piece of rethinking that's going to have to happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, Benjamin, you've been very generous with your time. I really appreciate you sharing your thoughts on all these really super important and interesting topics. And thank you for the book, and thank you for your work. And uh, again, the book is Religion and the Rise of Capitalism. It's a, by, the, by the way, it's a beautifully produced book. I love these, that kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, cantered pages like that that are not perfectly cut in the typography and all that. I'm old school. I like actual physical books. <laughs> so well, I'm told I'm told that my this is this I I don't pretend to know a lot about the book business, but I'm told that what you're referring to is something of a trademark for my publisher, Knopf. Yes. And yes. so yeah. And and so I, I think I think they do that on on all of their on all of their books. But thank you very much I for your hospitality. I even, read, I even read newspapers, physical newspapers. That's how old school I am. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I do too. But uh, you have to remember, this is very much a generational yeah, thing. Yeah. Uh, both of my sons were, are absolutely on top of anything that's in the newspaper. But uh, if you ask them, uh, you know, uh, what page something was on, mm. uh, they would have no idea because <laughs> right. it would not occur to either of them to uh, uh, to buy a physical copy of the newspaper. But I think these are generational matters. Yeah. I see it in my students at Harvard, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, too. They have, and it for and it forms different instincts uh, too uh, than than we have. Uh, young people today are very impatient. Mm -hmm with the idea of pausing to stew about some date or some name or some fact yeah. that we can't recall. <laughs> uh, their view is, uh, you know, you, 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 you whip out your cell phone and in right. five seconds, you know, what the, you know what the answer is and you don't <laughs> right. waste time on it. Yeah, exactly. This is, this is how progress. But thank you very much for having <laughs> me. I enjoy talking with you.